so today's presentation, my name is Ross Byler uh, from Growth Spark. Um, today's presentation is called Roping, Scoping, and Closing Deals, How to Sell WordPress. A little bit of information about myself. Uh, I graduated from Babson College, local business school here in the Boston area. I founded Growth Spark back in 2008. We are a uh, local WordPress design and development shop. Um, I was fortunate enough to be nominated by Business Week as one of the top 25 entrepreneurs under 25, which means I might know something. And I was also a WordCamp sponsor uh, 2009, no, sorry, 2010, 2011, and 2012. Uh, a few samples just from our portfolio, just to give you a sense for the kind of WordPress stuff we do. Um, here's a client project. Uh, they have a mobile application platform, Beat Henry. Another client that uh, has a beta release of a real estate search engine. Um, called Kiwi Listings, and a third, a investment management company called F Square. All of those sites are built in WordPress. But today, we're talking about sales. Um, we're not talking about WordPress design or WordPress development. So, WordPress, how, actually, first let me ask, how many of you guys are WordPress designers, developers, uh, run an agency that sells WordPress as some sort of service or offering or anything like that? All right. Awesome, because <laughs> this presentation is about you guys and not about WordPress. Um, however, I know all of you love WordPress, and I will make sure that the references that we make in terms of our sales process and understanding sales will be specific to WordPress. But one thing that's really important to understand is that no matter how much we love WordPress, and we come to work camp every year and everything like that, whenever we have to get ready for sale, talk to a client, we have to remember one thing, our clients don't care about WordPress. <laughs> now some clients might. Some clients might come to you and say, oh, I'm looking for a WordPress developer. I'm looking for uh, meeting the following you know, WordPress requirements. But most clients are coming to you because they have real business problems. Things like lead generation, creating more brand awareness, engaging their customers online. They have problems that are directly related to the revenue, the growth, the future performance of their organization. The good thing about WordPress, and that we all know, is that WordPress is a solution that can help solve those problems. WordPress can be used to create communities where customer engagement can happen. It can be used as a forum to help customer solutions or questions or Q&A. It can be used for lead generation. If you want to capture contact information and uh, do all sorts of cool things with integrating with e-commerce. WordPress is an endless solution. And that's what we know. And that's what we love. And that's why today what we need to do is understand how to sell all those great solutions that WordPress can offer to our clients. So let's talk a little bit about what sales is. And to talk about what it is, let's first talk about what it's not. Work, a sales is not marketing. Now, most people will bundle sales and marketing, they'll put them together, they think that the personalities are the same, they think that the uh, tactics are the same, the strategies are the same. Personally, I like to split marketing and sales as far apart as possible. Marketing is about creating excitement, marketing is about building your brand, marketing is about generating potential customers. But sales is about creating actual customers, actual clients, closing actual deals, and actually generating revenue and not just cost. The other thing is that sales is not about knowing the features and benefits of your product, in this case, WordPress. Someone comes to you and say, oh, I need a WordPress, uh, I need a website. Oh, well, let me tell you what WordPress can do. Bah, 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 bah. They don't care about that. They need a uh, website because they have some specific problem with their business that needs to be addressed by using their website as a solution. The third thing is that sales is not smooth talking huckstering, especially when it comes to <laughs> development or design. We're working in a professional, highly skilled industry where you're not going to win clients by being smooth talking and throwing out promotions and quick deals and quick schemes that might traditionally be associated with this sort of sales persona of a used car salesman. That's not what sales is about either. What it is, it's about building quality relationships. And hopefully everyone kind of knows this uh, at the core, is that sales is really meeting someone or meeting a group of people and building a relationship with that person or group of people that can hopefully last longer than a single transaction, especially as designers and developers and marketers. Ideally, we want to get more than just one website out of the deal. In fact, if we can get one client, close that one client, and then get five products from that one client over and over and over, you're actually cutting your effort down by a fifth. The other thing is that sales, and this is what I really want to stress today, 
is that sales is about solving your client's problems. That's your number one goal. It's not the features and benefits. It's not WordPress this, WordPress that. It's about solving the problems that your customer has. So let's talk a little bit about the sales process. Um, keep in mind that this sales process is, is sort of what we do at GrowSpark. Uh, everyone's sales process is going to be slightly different. Obviously, if you're just a designer or if you're just a developer, that'll change your process slightly. Um, if you're also incorporating <coughs> marketing, that's going to change your process slightly. If you do custom work versus template-based work, that might change your process. But for our frame of reference, we do custom design, WordPress design, and development sites. So with a sort of full scope of a project. And our process is broken into, down into four major phases. Qualification, needs assessment, scope analysis, and proposal presentation. So the first thing, qualification. Qualification is all about finding fit. It's all about identifying, hey, this guy was referred to me from my mom. I wonder if they're going to be a good potential customer, or is it going to be some other guy just trying to get a quick, cheap website? It's going to be about really identifying re opportunities or leads into opportunities. And the first step into proper qualification is defining your sales lens. The better you know your client and your customer, your target audience, the better you're going to be able to pick up the phone, have that initial conversation, and know within five minutes whether or not they're going to be a fit. Because it's not worth spending five hours, 10 hours, 20 hours, all the way through the whole process of dra drafting up a proposal to find out that they say, oh yeah, you know, it's not a fit because we don't have the right budget. Or, oh yeah, you know, it's not the right fit because we have to get it done yesterday. You want to find out fit, and we look at fit in three particular lenses, resource fit, technical fit, and cultural fit as soon as possible. Now, resource fit, we look at as sort of the time budget question, right? Do they have the budget to work with us? Because we have fixed costs and we need to make sure that we meet those costs. Do they have the time? Are they looking to get this done in a time frame that fits, given our current capacity of work and given, given our, our general turnaround for projects? The second thing is technical fit. Is what they're asking even possible to be done? Can we do it in WordPress? Can we do it as a team? Do we need to bring in outside contractors? And the last thing is cultural fit. Do I like this guy? Do I really want to spend the next six months of my life talking to them day in and day out? And oftentimes, believe it or not, that can be a deal breaker. If you don't like the style that they're going to want to engage in, or they don't like your style, they don't maybe they want someone who's very process oriented, or they don't want someone who's just off the fly and changing all the time. Figuring out that cultural fit, in my opinion, is just as important as technical and resource fit. And the way we do that is, in an initial conversation, we call the qualification call or meeting. We like to kind of cover four primary things. One, what are the resource requirements? What's your budget? What's your timeline? Now, you ask most people, they're not going to tell you their budget. The way around that, if you say, what's your budget? Oh, well, we don't know. You've probably done a couple dozen sites, a couple hundred sites, maybe just a handful of sites. But you can probably come up with some average cost. And if you average out all your websites, and it turns out that most of your sites start at $10,000, tell them. The first five minutes. If you ask them what their budget is and they don't tell you, just say, that's no problem. Just so you know, our website started at $10,000. I guarantee you, you're going to be able to qualify them immediately. And you're going to save yourself hours and hours and hours and hours of time. Because they're either going to say, okay, yeah, yeah, all right, we can start with that. Or, what? I thought this was going to be like 150 bucks. That's what my cousin was going to do it for. <laughs> so getting that kind of question out as soon as possible is extremely important. The next thing is partnership requirements. And this one I really like. Literally ask them. What are you looking for in your web designer and developer? And not other than quality work, other than you know, being responsive, other than things that you'd expect out of a professional engagement, what are you looking for? Do you want someone that's local? Do you want someone that has specific experience in your industry? Do you want someone who's a good looking 510 guy from Boston? Who knows? <laughs> the third thing is decision making process. Ask them, what does it take for you to make a decision in this project? What is it going to take for us to be able to move things along? Who do I need to speak with? Do you have a proposal draft, or a proposal acceptance process? Is there an RFP that I have to meet? Do you have other requirements that I need to know about? Really identifying those particular questions is extremely helpful when you're going to go through the whole sales process. You don't want to find out right in the last minute that they actually have a specific format that the proposal needs to fit when you're presenting it. Last thing is timeline. Sometimes you know they might sound excited, sound eager, but it's a big corporate decision and they're not going to be able to make it until the next quarter. So ask them, what do you think you're going to actually want to start this project? And how long of a decision timeline are we going to be looking at here? Because you don't want to stress out about coming up with a proposal if it turns out they're not going to make a move until a quarter from now. 
Real quick tip, something that we like to do, we don't always do this, but uh, we, we will do it sometimes, especially if we have a lot of leads coming in, is we can actually streamline qualification by putting someone through what we call an inquiry form. And this isn't your standard contact form, just come to my website and what's your name, email, and why are you talking to me. It's a detailed, give us an overview of your project. What are your goals? Describe your company. What re requirements do you have? And give them some checklist options. What's your budget? What's your timeline? Get these questions answered right in your qualification form. And another hint too, if you have a drop down for your budget, if the budget starts at $10,000, they're either not gonna fill out the form or they're gonna email you and say, oh, it looks like you might be too expensive. You just save yourself hours and hours and hours of time. Save yourself time as salespeople. Please do not waste it with people who are not qualified. So the next step, needs assessment. As I said before, it's about solving business problems. Your clients have real issues that are related to their costs, related to their revenue, related to their marketing, related to their growth. So the first thing you wanna do is identify the business needs. And obviously it's, it's within the realm of the website, you don't need to ask them questions that are irrelevant. How do you go about building your product? Well, that might be helpful, but for the purposes of sales, you really wanna get into what are the business needs as it relates to the site. So talk about what role does your website play in the marketing and sales of your organization? Is it something that your salespeople use to qualify people? Or is it something that you actually use to educate past clients and to create repeat clients and customers? Figuring out those types of questions can really help frame the conversation because now you're not coming in there and saying, well, WordPress is great, let me tell you why, and this is what we're gonna do. You're coming in and you're gonna say, hey, business owner, I'm a business owner. Let's talk a little bit about how I can help your business grow and really focus on those business-related questions. Of course, it is still a website, and you do have to identify the technical issues. So you wanna make sure that you spend time talking about what are your technical requirements, how many pages, uh, how many unique templates, and really work through the whole uh, you know, process that you need to identify the scope of work. Now, one thing that's really important is know your audience. If they are a technical person, if you're speaking to the CTO or the CIO or something of an organization, then great, speak in code. But if you're talking to someone who's a founder, entrepreneur, or CMO, or someone who's real business savvy, but maybe not technically savvy, work within the language that they're comfortable with. Because it's about your comfort's client, your client's comfort, not yours. The other thing, too, is that your clients, and some are going to come to you with an RFP, some of them are going to come to you and they're going to have clear needs, but not all of them. In fact, a lot of them are going to say, you know, I need a website, I don't know how much it costs, I don't know what I, I should do with it. I, I know my compet uh, competitors, they all have websites, but I really have no idea where to start. It's your job as an expert to uncover these needs. What you want to do is dig in deep. Again, talking about their business. Really taking the time to work through understanding their business can help you uncover needs that they might not even know. So it's your job to uncover any kind of need that your client might have. The other thing is that typically, and this is for us, we can usually get the sort of qualification and needs assessment phases done in one call or one meeting. Because you qualify someone pretty quickly, and if they're qualified, then you immediately jump into, well, what do you need? Let's talk a little bit about the project. The sales process is just that. It's a process. Typically, if it's a robust site, you're not going to have a single interaction and then close the deal. It's going to require multiple meetings, multiple phone calls, etc. Always set a next step. When are we going to meet next? When are we going to talk next? What's the deliverable? What are you going to be doing, and what am I going to be doing? Make sure that every engagement you have with a client has a following engagement, a follow up with a time, with a date, with a, every single action that both parties need to take will ensure that you're progressing along and getting closer and clo closer and closer to the close as opposed to just letting things sort of like, oh yeah, well I'll get back to you, let me just look at this. Now the third phase is scope analysis. Now this is where things I think get more WordPress oriented, much more technical. We look at sort of the the scope analysis process, and we kind of break it down into four different major sections. So the first is defining project requirements. Now, what we look at as project requirements are more high level. So a client's gonna to come to us, we wanna identify, do you need design? Do you need development? What's your content development strategy? What's your content implementation strategy? What's your SEO strategy? Figuring out all those sort of higher level questions that are really gonna dictate the general scope of work is a great place to start because it, Obviously, if you're a design development agency, you don't do SEO, you probably don't do content development, but if that's a key requirement from your client, you need to identify that and get the appropriate resources in place so that you don't lose the deal because you overlooked a need that you can't necessarily directly service, but is still a crucial component to your client's requirements. 
The second is defining the functional requirements. And this is where we get into the more sort of fun from a WordPress developer standpoint. What are you looking to build? You know, do you want to integrate with social media so that people can come to your you know, forum and log in with their Facebook account? Or do you want to build a WordPress e-commerce site that allows you to have products that can be built on a monthly subscription rate? You know, really getting into those technical questions. Now, the key thing here, though, is you can't, again, without knowing your audience, just jump right into asking specific, specific technical questions if your audience isn't comfortable with that. So start at the business level. What's your goal? Oh, well, we'd like to you know, generate leads on our website. That's great. Talk to me a little bit about what that means to you. Well, we want them to be able to fill out a form, and that form can then be sent to our CRM, and, and that's what we want. Okay, awesome. In your mind, you need a contact form management solution, such as Gregory Forms, and they need to have a CRM, such as Salesforce, and then you need to perform some sort of integration between Gravity Forms and Salesforce. That's the sort of functional requirements that you should be building in your mind or on paper that your client can't necessarily dictate. Now the third thing is design requirements. And we look at the design requirements really from understanding how many, as we all know WordPress is a CMS, how many unique templates do you need, not how many pages. Usually you can start with the how many pages do you have on your website or what are you expecting. And that can give you a general sense for the breadth but then from there, you can break it down and say, okay, well, let's talk a little bit about what unique layouts, structures, designs, content types that we need to work with to create sort of a scope of design, a scope of templates. And obviously, you need to identify whether doing wireframing is appropriate or if you're just going to be jumping right into mock-ups. And then also under identifying what are those templates going to take in terms of development. So although this is design requirements, you need to know if it's X number of templates, well, then you have to do, you have to do the wireframing, you have to do the design, you have to do the front-end development and you have to do the back-end development for those templates. And the last component is content requirements. And personally, since WordPress 3.0 has come out, I really, really like to spend time talking about the content requirements. There's so many really cool things, I'm sure all of you guys know, that you can do with custom post types, creating custom fields, creating relationships between different types of content, creating different options in the back end that provides your clients much more granular control over the content across the website, you need to ask your clients questions that will help prompt an understanding of what kind of custom host types or structures you need to set up in the site. So if you talk to someone and let's say they're a photographer, they might say, yeah, I need a you know, website, I want to showcase my photography, I want to show some of my past clients, you know, and I want to talk about you know, the different um, areas that I serve. Well, in your mind, you might be able to say, well, great, they need a portfolio, so that's portfolio custom post type. They need clients, they need a client sort of custom post type, and they need lo you know, geographic locations or target audiences. That could be a custom post type. And I'm going to set it up so that every audience has an associated body of you know, content or associated body of, of past portfolio work. So let me think how that's going to look in the scope of this work. So take the time to map out all the different types of content and relationships that the client's going to need with the content that you have set up. Does that make sense? Can you ask you a question? Yeah. Do you have them um, provide you the content? Like, are can you, you please use the mic? Sorry, can you please use the microphone? Um, oh. Can you hear me? Oh. It's being recorded. <laughs> we have a um, problem, we have issues sometimes getting the content yep. from the client. Yep is a big deal. Absolutely. Um, so G, we have that written in the proposal that they need to provide you with the content and the date, and if you don't have the content by a certain date, um, what do you do? Yeah, a absolutely, and, and that's where the first section of project requirements, okay. the key thing that we always identify, by default, we don't write content, we don't even implement the content. Okay. We don't do that. Okay. If you want us to do that, that's great, we can do it, and we're gonna charge you hourly, or we're gonna charge you per, pay, per page. But as a client, our goal is to train you to be self-sufficient in WordPress. So our understanding is that you're going to prepare the content, and by this date, like you said, so by the conclusion of development, which is X, you're right. going to have X number of files prepared to then implement, at which point we'll begin the training, and you'll have two weeks, or one week, or a month, or however long, mm -hmm. to implement that content. And if you don't implement it by a certain date, well, you're going to have to pay us the remaining balance regardless. So we work in policies that dictate how the client should expect to deal with things like content. Because it's, it's been a, a struggle for us since, since day one. And we're getting better at it, but again, mm -hmm. you're, you're only going to be as good as how defined you are with handling those kind of requirements. Right. Now, I get the content, but yep. we also had, had a real problem with the, last, with the, um, d the design of the website yep. down to the colors. And it was like we said, we should have gotten that on the first meeting. Mm -hmm. you know? And so we're, we're still learning. But yep. that's what I need to 
Yeah. Well, I think we can have a great conversation afterwards. We can talk all about how you okay. control and that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Um, one thing I really like to do, I'm a very process-oriented guy, in case you guys can't tell, um, is to template as much as my sales process as possible. Everything I do. So every time I write a project scope document, which to the client is this two, three, four, five page document that's super detailed and annotated, my hint is I have 80% of it already done. <laughs> so get all that you can put together ahead of time, so that way when it comes to doing the sales process, you already have things that you can just bang out, fill out, you know, change things like the project objective for this client is such and such, and I'll remove these project requirements, but then add these templates and so on and so forth. The more you can template, the more efficient you're going to be, the more efficient you're going to be, the more you can sell, because the more time you're going to have. The last phase is proposal presentation. Don't forget that your proposal is the last opportunity, right, that you have to sell your client. So don't just give them this roughly put together, unformatted Word document that they can't read because it's all in technical lingo. Give them something that's clean, that's organized, that's professional, and that's ideally even branded with your company's logo, tagline, so on and so forth. We use a tool called Tinderbox. Tinderbox is a proposal management software. There's a bunch of them out there. I think Proposable is another one. It's a fantastic tool because one, it can template all of our proposals so that all that sort of stock, well this is what we do here, and here's how our phases work, and so on and so forth, all that can be put together ahead of time. So all I'm adding <coughs> is the specific scope of work, the client name, and the cost, and that's it. I can literally write a proposal within 15 minutes after I put all the scope work together in the scope analysis phase. And this saves me a tremendous amount of time, but still provides a high quality, extremely engaging document that our clients can use and interact with. The second thing is defining your project policies, and this is, again, referencing content, content development, content implementation, how you handle 301 redirects. It could be any kind of nuanced thing. Spell that out in your proposal as clearly as possible. Don't hide it in the contract. Don't cover it in legalese. Just let them know, listen, we don't do content implementation. I know that sounds kind of crazy, and I know you're expecting a website with the content in it, but that's not what we do. We're going to train you. You're going to be responsible for implementing content. But it's going to be good because, you know, then you're going to be self-sufficient and everyone's happy and we save you money. It's up to you to really make sure that your client truly understands how this engagement is going to work as clearly as possible in the proposal phase. Because the last thing you want is in the ninth hour for a client to say, well, I thought you were going to be doing that. Well, no, it's in our contract. Where? Uh, section A, B, 1, 2, 3, you know, paragraph 2. Well, okay, obviously I didn't read that. No one reads that kind of stuff. So spell it out clearly right in your proposal. The last thing... Don't just ship it and forget it. Don't just write up your proposal, send it off, and say, hey, Jim, let me know how you, what you think. Set up a time, a date, a place to meet, to call, to do whatever you can to present the proposal to the client. Now, obviously, you want to give them some time to review it ahead of time, maybe an hour, maybe a day, whatever it might be. But try to set up that meeting to review the proposal with the client as soon as possible. Because when you get them on the phone and it's still fresh in their mind and they haven't been influenced by their, you know, their wife or their husband or their CEO or whoever, you can find out their true reaction. They're going to let you know, oh, this, this is actually great, this is, on, this is on point, I think this is fantastic. Or you know what, we actually have these concerns, boom, boom, boom. If you can address concerns, if you can answer questions when it's still fresh in their mind, you have, you're going to have a higher likelihood of closing that deal because now you're not leaving it up to the gods to hope that they're not going to get things confused or the CEO looks at it because he hasn't been involved in the whole process whatsoever and says, no, nope, this is too much money, when actually it's exactly the amount of money that they agreed to spend during the qualification phase. These kind of things can be addressed very uh, positively in that, in, in that proposal presentation phase so long as you actually speak with the client. So don't just send it off and hope for the best. So a recap. First thing, qualify for fit. Make sure that you know that this client is going to be a fit because they have the time, the budget, the requirements that you can deliver on, and that they're decent human beings. Two, assess the client needs and focus on the business needs first. Figure out what is the real driver behind their decision with this website. Are they redesigning because their competitor has a better looking website? Or are they adding a new feature because their whole sales operational model has now changed? Craft a clear project scope and use templates. Save yourself the time and actually use those templates to prompt you in asking the questions that help define the scope. And the last thing is propose like a pro, as in as a professional. Make sure you're using high quality templates. Make sure you're using proposals that feel like they're compelling. They feel like they're branded. You want to give the right impression to your clients, especially when you're right about to hopefully close the deal. And that's it.
Please use the mic for questions with your name. So. Yep. Will you post the slides? Yes. Yeah, I'll add them to the slide share later on today. Will you post everything you said? <laughs> I think they recorded it, so the video will, uh, will definitely be up there. Hi, oh, Ross. Could we get a, a copy of a sample proposal? Oh, yeah. um, why don't we meet? And then we can talk more specifically, uh, just because there's obviously no disclosure issues Understood. with that. Yeah, but I would be happy to talk a little bit more in depth about the kind of proposal template that we use and, and that sort of thing. Um, why don't you see me after the presentation? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I have a question. Oh, actually, when, okay. you, when you get to an impasse at some point in the proposal phase, so the client they they have one set of expectations in terms of what you're going to deliver, and then and it's similar to what you're already proposing, but the client's not quite grasping it. How do you kind of bring them into your understanding of it? Uh, all right, so if, if, give me like a specific example. So if, you're, if your client is expecting you to do something that you just are so don't like post, typically like do. post management would be a great example. Yeah. Like how would you make them feel comfortable with the fact that, listen, it's going to be on your own, but we're going to show you and train you how to do it. Like sometimes there's a disconnect in explaining that. Like yeah. How do you go to overcome it? Absolutely. Uh, I think two, two things. One is that I like to actually address those things even during scope analysis. When I'm presenting the project scope, I always define those kind of project requirements, like how do we deal with training and content management, so on and so forth. It allows you to not have those sorts of last minute concerns in the proposal presentation. The second thing is you want to align your scope, your solution, to your client's needs. And oftentimes, the client is choosing, they're going to say to you, well, I need a website. Fantastic. It's going to be a big website. Awesome. I need a way to manage it myself. Okay, or oh, I have a team that's gonna be managing it. Fantastic. They're gonna give you business needs that are gonna drive reasons why making them self-sufficient, having them handle content implementation, having them handle content development makes sense. Because again, it's all about aligning your scope, your solution to their needs. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm just a small um, designer, but sure. I'm, I'm planning in the future, and when you're, when you're sending proposals in, do you qualify on the front end who the decision makers are and who all will be involved, and then how do you follow up when you have, like, say, maybe a CEO needs to sign off on it as well as a CMO or maybe even a, you know, anybody else on the actual design and development team that they might even have in house as yeah. well if you're doing that. Yeah. A absolutely. Um, it's definitely important to identify that in the qualification phase um, and just ask. So in this you know, process, obviously, we're going to be talking about a website, and you're going to have to approve whether we're going to be a fit for your organization or not. Well, who is going to be involved in that decision? Just ask them right out. Uh, and if they tell you, oh, our CEO is involved, fantastic. Anyone can get him involved in this meeting or her involved in this meeting. Um, and if they can't, then one strategy right, is you want to become their best friend. If you realize you're not working with the decision maker and there's no way that you can work with the decision maker, your next objective is to make sure that person's job is as, as, as like going to be handled as best as possible. Because they, are, they have to look good. They have to look good in the eyes of their boss. You want to do everything you can. So you have to ask them, all right, what can we do together to make sure that your CEO signs off on this? And you'd be surprised how just asking questions like this, mm -hmm. as straightforward as that might be, are actually effective. Okay. Yeah. And just to follow yeah. up, and your, your, your recommendation would be to get all of those decision makers into one meeting to not have to spread them out. Ideally, yeah. yes. Okay. And, and I think there are ways, you know, an initial call, a qualification, you know, I think it's, it's fine to get certain things, you know, you don't want to get someone high level involved in something that's going to be quick, well, what's your budget? Oh, it's... 5,000 bucks, oh, we can't do that, sorry. Right. Don't want to waste people's time. Okay. But once you get through that, then it might make sense to start bringing people in. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, you guys do a lot with custom work. Uh, what do you guys think about packages and putting together predefined features, functionality? Because I work with small businesses, sure. that's typically what they're looking for, is like, yeah. I need kind of this, and we can kind of build a package. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, and it's actually, it's a really fundamental question as to what kind of agency you want to run. Um, so, GrowSpark, right, we do custom design development work. We have a, a brand, if you will, called Spark Launch, which is a package solution for small businesses. And for us, the two brands are separate, and what we want each brand to stand for is quite separate. And it's really just a question as to whether or not you want to be known for efficiency, cost effectiveness, customer service at a low price point, or highly custom engaging, award winning kind of work. So it's going to be, it's going to be a little bit of a personal question, I would say. Yeah. How do you deal with the <coughs> changes throughout the project? Or let's say either either if you m misquoted in the very beginning uh, and didn't get the whole scope of the work and realize it's going to cost you a lot more than initially, yep. 
uh, to develop or the other way around if you kind of ordered everything correctly and the client starts making changes to the requirements, right. uh, not drastically but subtly, mm -hmm. but such that it affects your budget? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. The first thing I would say is policy. It's all about having the right policies and spelling them out clearly in your proposal. If you decide to change any component of this project scope, we're going to bill you hourly at $150 an hour, period. Or we're going to have to renegotiate the project scope. Or we're just great people and we're going to do whatever you want us to do. It's totally up to you. How you handle that is totally up to you. Oftentimes, if we see something that is going to be a 15-minute change, we do it. No, no questions asked. An hour change, we might even do it. No questions asked. But if the client's like, oh, yeah, changes and this and this, and all of a sudden it's a 10-hour list, then you have to say, okay, listen, this is what we agreed to, and this is what we're looking at now. And you want to make sure that you're, you're very straightforward with the client and as communicative about scope changes as possible. And the other thing is you want to build a process that allows you to prevent scope alteration. This is never going to happen, but ideally you get as close to preventing <laughs> scope alteration as possible. So the more significant or more specific sign off you can get from your clients along the way, such as first we do wireframing, you're going to approve the wireframing. We're then going to move into design. If you decide to change the structure of our design and not the graphics, then we're going to assume that is a adjustment to the scope. Or if you decide to add additional templates, that's going to be adjustment to the scope. Getting a process that allows you to hold them accountable for the agreement or the sign-off that they have provided, phase after phase after phase, allows you to prevent, ideally or partially, those kind of issues. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Walid, with, uh, owner of Sphinx Web Design. And, um, actually, I, I know this. Your stuff, your tips here, definitely work because I had. Um, I noticed. You did the F squared investment website, and yeah. they actually came to me. And I Sorry. Win the sale. You did, so. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll buy you a beer tonight. <laughs> but, um, my question is uh, more in regards to um, managing the sales process. Yep. So, is there any uh, particular software or CRM you use to absolutely keep track? Yeah. Do you have any absolutely. With that? Um, it's a great question because there are hundreds of CRMs yeah. on the market. And for most of us, designers, developers, where we're typically doing fixed cost projects, I would assume, I really like pipeline deals. Okay. I use pipeline deals. I've used it for the last three years or something like that. It's perfect for uh, fixed cost project engagements. It's not good with product-based e-commerce type stuff. It's not good with uh, retainer-based tracking, things like that. But if you say, hey, listen, I have a deal. The deal's worth X thousand. You know, I want to manage that process. It has lead management, okay. contact management, tracking notes, tracking tasks, running reports, analytics, okay. and it's like 15 bucks a month. And that syncs with your lead generation, so when you get leads coming in or... Not or, directly, but you okay. can just set up a contact form that, okay. set, that basically syncs them okay. up. I'll yeah. check it out. Yeah, it's cool. Thank yeah, you. Okay. absolutely. Hi there. Um, we, I run a small web design and development business with my husband. Yep. And Proposals are a nightmare and we hate doing yeah. them. And the hardest part is deciding how much something's going to cost. Yeah. A huge part of that is that we're not very good at tracking how long things take. Yeah. Um, especially my husband. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but an another, um, one, one part that we struggle with, we, we, we tend to have clients that are under the $10,000 budget yep. mark. And they're often nonprofits or small mm -hmm. businesses. And they're, they want more than they can afford. Yep. So your your pro, your part of your sales process is to give them options, mm -hmm. and and so I'm curious how much you do breaking down a project and into particular functionalities or stages or things like, hey, you know you want us to implement the content, but that's going to cost you this much. I mean, in yeah. your case, you just make it an extra. Maybe it's you know right. a key part. And I, I'm just curious how much breaking down you do. Is that, it short? That's a great question. Um, so all of our projects are. Fixed price, and yep. we don't say fixed price line items. It's it's X thousand dollars. That's it. I'm not breaking this down because I am pricing a value focused product. I'm not giving you something that's based on the number of hours I'm putting in this because, frankly, whatever I estimate is going to be wrong. But what I know is that the value of my product is such because other people pay me that. That's the only reason why. <laughs> but the key thing I would say is introducing cost as early as possible qualification, figuring out their budget. During scope analysis, just just lay it out. Say, listen, you know, we've done something like this before. Uh, what we're looking at here looks like it's going to be more along this sort of scope of work. Um, if that's sort of within your comfort zone, that's fantastic. Let's move forward with that. If not, maybe what we can do is look at this in two phases. And I think what would make sense is here's your core functionality, here's your extended functionality. Let's break those apart. And let's maybe do two projects. And that just kind of open, honest, budget-focused 
conversation, it tends to be very well perceived. Um, I do SEO work for a lot of uh, web developers. Yep. Do you have any suggestions or tips on what, from your perspective, working with people that do SEO, the type of things you look for, or what do you, you know, how, how, can it, how can I help to work better with my clients? Yeah, okay, so your, your clients being the d developers, developers more or less. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, I mean, SEO is fairly broad, so it's important to be able to come to the table and say specifically, this is how I can help you as a developer. I know that developers need someone to implement content, someone to add all the meta information for content, someone to handle the 301 redirects, someone to handle coming up with a landing page strategy. If you can come to the table with a conversation piece that is focused on what you can do for your developer, specifically, not just I do SEO, what do you need? This is what I've seen other developers like you need. I think you're going to find a better result. And I think that people are going to be able to appreciate a lot more. If you came to me and said, oh, well, I do SEO, how can I help you? Well, I would say, well, I actually happen to know specifically what you can do. But if you came and said, hey, I do SEO, I know developers typically need these things, are any of those in your, your portfolio of needs? Is there any way we can talk about how I can help you with that? I think that's probably the best way to approach. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great.